Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for coming today. And once again, welcome to the 2022 Annual Human Rights Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Bill Armeline. I'm the Director of the Human Rights Institute here at San Jose State University. It's again a pleasure to have you and it's a pleasure to have our guest this afternoon. The point of this series is to bring together critical decision makers, community stakeholders, scholars, and students to analyze their most pressing human rights crises and their potential solutions. Given the official end of the formal U.S. war in Afghanistan and Russian invasion of Ukraine, this year's series is focused on the dangers of American militarism and nuclear weapons proliferation. Many thanks to those of you who came to our event on Wednesday. Today's event will be focused on nuclear weapons, understanding and reducing the growing danger. A couple house housekeeping notes to start. Uh, audience members are encouraged to submit questions for our speaker via the Q&A function. At 3.10, here in a few minutes, we'll transition to the talk portion where Dr. Prager will present a talk and slides on today's topic for approximately 40 minutes. Afterwards, we'll follow up with Q&A. Uh, and now for our land acknowledgement, we'd like to begin by recognizing that while we gather at San Jose State University, we are gathered on the ethno-historic tribal, ter ter tribal territory of the, th of the Thamian Ohlone, who are direct ancestors of the li lineage enrolled in the Muakma Ohlone tribe and who were missionized into missions, Santa Clara, San Jose, and Dolores. The lands on which San Jose State University is established was and continues to be of significance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. We also recognize that the ancestors of the Muwekma Ohlone constructed and maintained the three Bay Area missions. Our campus extends to surrounding areas that held a Tupanac, a traditional roundhouse, which were once located in the historic Lope, Lo, Lopenia, Lopeniago land grant rancho Polsomi, y Positas de las Animas, and also Marcelo and Cristobal's Land Grant Rancho Ulsalac, which were places of celebration and religious ceremonies, as well as nearby ancestral heritage shell mounds that served as the tribe's traditional cemetery sites and territorial monuments. San Jose State University also desires to honor the military service of the Muwekma men and women who have honorably served overseas during World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraq, and those who are serving in the United States Armed Forces today. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce our moderator for this event, Dr. Curtis Asplund, Assistant Professor in the SGSU Department of Physics and Astronomy. Dr. Asplund holds a PhD in Theoretical Physics from UC Santa Barbara and has recently begun a one-year Next Generation Fellowship with the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction, which organizes uh, physical scientists to advocate for policies that reduce the threat posed by nuclear weapons. And now I'll turn it over to Curtis. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Armeline. And thank you so much to you and the whole Human Rights Institute for collaborating with me on making this event possible. Um, I'm honored in turn to introduce our speaker for today. And keep in mind, yeah, I will be keeping an eye on the Q&A. And so at the conclusion of the talk, uh, I'll uh, draw from that to ask our speaker. All right, so let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Stuart Prager is a, profession, a professor of astrophysical sciences at Princeton University and an affiliated faculty member with the program on science and global security there. He holds a PhD in plasma physics from Columbia University. And until 2018, his research was dedicated primarily to plasma physics with applications to fusion energy and to a lesser extent, astrophysics. From 2009 to 2016, he was director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, a Department of Energy National Laboratory. He received the 2008 Dawson Award for Excellence in Plasma Physics from the American Physical Society and the Leadership and Distinguished Career Awards from Fusion Power Associates. In 2018, he switched his focus to security issues and is co-founder of the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction of which I am a member, as was just mentioned, and a Next Generation Fellow. We're very pleased to have Professor Prager here uh, with us today to talk about this um, important and serious topic. So you have the floor, Dr. Prager. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me just first uh, share my screen and then I'll, I'll begin. Uh, almost there. Let me collapse this. Okay, can can you see that okay? Looks good, I think. 
Okay, great. Okay, so let's begin with first, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to the Human Rights Institute. Uh, it's a great pleasure and I look forward to giving you some information, but more than that, for the uh, discussion at the end. Um, this is a, uh, a topic, nuclear weapons, that I think is extremely important and that's why I'm here to talk about it. It's a fascinating topic as well, but it's, it's not a fun topic. Um, but on the other hand, it's a topic that we can do something about. We don't have to totally despair. And that motivated some of us, uh, as Dr. Osplund said, to form the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction, which is one of many groups which is hoping to do something to reduce the nuclear threat. Uh, we're very happy that uh, we have working with us one year, Dr. Asplund, who's working with us as a, as a fellow. Um, this organization was started by the American Physical Society. So one thing I, I should mention is that anything I say, any opinions I express, uh, don't represent the American Physical Society, they're just my own. So let, let me uh, begin. Uh, let me see. There, oh, there we go. Um, so nuclear weapons and their implications. This is a very big topic. And one way to approach it would just be to uh, provide the facts because the facts of nuclear weapons are stark. Uh, they're enormous and really they speak for themselves. Almost nothing need be said once one has the facts about it. However, uh, <clears throat> I think it's important also to provide some interpretation perspective on these facts because the implication of the facts are just too large to digest without some help. At least I found that to be true for myself. Uh, you learn the facts and then um, it's just too, too, too difficult and I, I found that I had to read perspectives of others uh, to sort of appreciate that uh, I was interpreting things okay. Um, nuclear weapons, I think, is in a category of subjects that are easy to understand, uh, but difficult to grasp. <clears throat> Another <clears throat> One example of something easy to understand, but difficult to grasp might be the number of stars and galaxies in the universe, <clears throat> 100 billion stars in an average universe, maybe some estimates indicate 2 trillion, sorry, 100 billion stars in, per galaxy, and perhaps as many as 2 trillion galaxies in the universe. And so this is very something easy to say, but it's difficult to grasp in its enormity. <clears throat> Another example, <clears throat> I think is one's own death. It's very easy to understand. You either exist or you don't exist. That's not hard to understand. But the significance of one's own death is very, very difficult to grasp, hard to imagine not existing. And nuclear weapons, I think, is in this category because of it's both its enormity and its significance for, for humanity. It's just difficult to grasp. Um, let me give you, just to begin, one fact. And here's one fact about nuclear weapons today. A few men possess the power <clears throat> to end civilization just by pushing bu some buttons, just to end civilization, end all of history, all the culture that's been built up and all the people. And these few people can do it within minutes of making the decision to do so. And they can do it any time of day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, this power is available to them. So this is a very simple fact, but to grasp it, I think is a very difficult. Um, <clears throat> I might mention that uh, the particular men that have this power are the presidents of uh, Russia and the US, which have the biggest arsenals, Putin and Biden. Before Biden, President Trump had this uh, power. But they're not the only ones. There are lesser but still potent uh, nuclear arsenals elsewhere. So just as examples, the prime ministers of uh, Pakistan and India, Prime Minister Khan and Modi, also have the power to kill hundreds of millions of people, maybe more, and there are other leaders of nuclear armed states that have similar power. This is a world we live in. And uh, this threat is out of sight and it's out of mind for most of us. I myself have never seen a nuclear weapon, <clears throat> yet we're all held hostage <clears throat> at every moment of every day uh, by this nuclear threat. So what I'd like to do, uh, ah, yes, but I should add though, this is a problem that uh, can be solved. 
For example, we can dismantle all nuclear weapons. Uh, we, we made them, we can dismantle them. There's no particular technical challenge to dismantling all the nuclear weapons. It's a man-made problem and it can be undone by us. It's a physically easier problem to solve than climate change or a pandemic. Uh, both of these serious crises are man-made, but they unleashed physical processes that are difficult to control. Not the case with nuclear weapons. You can just dismantle them. So what I'd like to do today is review for you some facts about nuclear weapons. Um, some of, I'll discuss some of the policies that govern these nuclear weapons. Uh, I'd like to alert you that at the moment there's a growing danger in nuclear weapons, where it's a, where, as, where the risk is as great now as it ever has been since the invention of nuclear weapons. <clears throat> because of the <clears throat> moment we're in, I'll, I'll mention some lessons we can maybe draw from or observations we can make with regard to the Ukraine crisis. And then I'll discuss uh, very briefly examples of what we can do to lessen this danger. So the nuclear weapons uh, derive from the enormous power of nuclear fission, the splitting of the atomic nucleus. And here I'm showing you a schematic of the fissioning of one uranium nucleus. And the way it occurs is a particle called a neutron, single neutron, bombards the uranium nucleus, it, 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 it uh, excites it, and then the nucleus splits into two uh, product nuclei, nuclei, in this case, krypton and barium nuclei. So one nucleus splits into two, but another thing happens, one neutron produces three more neutrons. So there's a neutron multiplication and there's a hundred fold amplification in energy. The kinetic energy in these uh, products the, uh, is about a hundred times greater than the energy of the initial neutron. That's the basis for the explosive power. But one fission reaction doesn't produce much power. You need billions and billions upon them, of them. And that's what you heard of, I'm sure, is the chain reaction where you don't just have many, but you have billions upon billions of nuclei fissioning. And the way this works is one nucleus fissions and it produces uh, several neutrons. Each neutron fissions another nucleus, which produces more neutrons and so on. So by this chain reaction, just exponentially grow the number of nuclei that are undergoing fission. And this is so rapid and so powerful that you can explode a, uh, an assembly of nuclei in one microsecond, one millionth of a second, and uh, I didn't put this down, but a couple of pounds of uranium can release as much explosive energy, uh, well, let me put it that, one, uh, as, as 15, about 15 million uh, times more weight of TNT. In other words, uh, nuclear weapons can be 15 million times more powerful than a chemical explosion such as TNT. And one thing this tells us immediately, past wars teach us nothing about nuclear war. The weapons used in past wars are millions of times weaker than the weapons that would be used if we ever had a nuclear war. It would be a totally qualitatively different event. Uh, chain reactions are familiar to us these days because we've all experienced the viral chain reaction. One, infect, one person might infect a couple uh, people, they each infect a couple of people, and that's why the virus grows exponentially rapidly. But a nuclear chain reaction is just millions of times more deadly than a viral chain reaction that gives rise to pandemic. The, the crisis we've experienced in the last two years would be negligible compared to that if we were to experience a nuclear chain reaction. But modern weapons don't only use a fission nuclear reaction, they use the other type of nuclear reaction, which is nuclear fusion, where you fuse two nuclei together so for example, if you take a, a deuterium and a tritium nuclei, these are forms of hydrogen, and you fuse them together, they give rise to a helium nucleus and a neutron. But what happens is the energy in the product nuclei, in this case, is about a thousand times larger than the energy of the incoming nuclei. So there too, it's extra explosive power. And uh, modern nuclear weapons today take advantage of both fission and fusion. So if you look inside a, a nuclear warhead, uh, you'll see typically two bombs in one warhead, a primary and a secondary. And the way it works is uh, first the primary explodes and really what's happening is a, a pit 
of uh, fissile material is being crushed uh, such that it, it triggers a chain reaction and you get a fission explosion. Uh, the fission explosion then uh, triggers the fusion explosion and you get two bombs going off in one and it's extremely, extremely powerful. Uh, what are the effects of these bombs? The effects of a single bomb well, the energy released is the energy is released in three different forms of energy. About half will come out as blast energy, just the the uh, the shock wave that emanates out from the blast. Uh, you can think of it as a very strong wind, or that that under understates it. So, about fifty percent comes out as a mechanical blast. About a third comes out as heat and uh, a thermal energy from the initial flash and about 15% comes out as nuclear radiation. And these three forms of energy can kill you in manifold ways. The blast can knock you down and knock down buildings. Uh, the blast that comes out generates hurricanes that can go faster than occur naturally in hurricane, winds that are, that, are, that are faster than occur naturally in hurricanes. You can get burned by the flash of the initial fireball. The um, a nuclear, nuclear blast in a city will cause massive fires and you can die in the fire. And finally, there's a nuclear radiation that can kill you. So it's pretty deadly. And just to give you a little bit of an image of the effect of a blast wave, this has been measured in 1953. Uh, scientists set up in the Nevada desert a blast of a 16 kiloton nuclear weapons. And this is the... the uh, the terminology that's used. What this means is that they set off a nuclear bomb that's equivalent to 16,000 tons of TNT. Again, one of these things hard to imagine. In 1953, and here it exploded in the Nevada desert. And what they did is they had a house set up. <clears throat> Here's a house set up. And the house was set up 3,500 feet, about two thirds of a mile from the blast. And this is what the blast did to the, to the house. First, they, flash from the fireball lit up the house. And then the intense uh, heat from the light from the fireball started to burn the house and burn the paint. And then uh, a little bit later, a fraction of a second later, the, uh, the blast wave arrived and you can see it just obliterated the house. It's just a wall of high pressure hit into the house. And this whole exposure, these frames are just 2.3 seconds. So within a second, a house uh, two-thirds of a mile from the blast is just completely obliterated. Well, you can ask, uh, I hate to show you this, uh, what can happen if you exploded a nuclear bomb over San Jose? And this is roughly what it looked like. Imagine that the bomb is exploded over San Jose over here. And uh, these circles show, this circle shows the uh, radius within which maybe half of people are killed and there's a grand leveling of buildings. And then out to the larger radius, uh, people can die from uh, there's the thermal burns from the flash. And it's estimated if you exploded a weapon in San Jose, and these are just estimates, maybe on the order, on the order of 185,000 people would die pretty much very quickly. And there would be about 460,000 injuries. And it's commonly said that if you have a nuclear, nuclear blast, the living will envy the dead. The deaths won't be pleasant. This is uh, over San Jose. If you, if you choose a more densely populated area, if you choose a nuclear bomb and you exploded it at 8,000 feet over New York City, and I should say the, uh, the, the, the San Jose and the New York examples are 350 kiloton bombs. So it's, it's equivalent to 350,000 tons of TNT, but these are average size bombs in the nuclear arsenal today. So an average size bomb in lower Manhattan, and this is near where the 9-11 attack occurred, would give, you can see it would kill people out to New Jersey and, uh, and the Queens and Brooklyn and Staten Island. It would kill about a million people and uh, injure about 2 million people. It would destroy New York City. New York City wouldn't exist anymore, basically. Uh, it would be thousands of times worse by any measure than 9-11 was and it would be the worst catastrophe probably to befall the United States. And this would be one bomb, one city. Clearly these are weapons that have no discrimination. These are weapons of genocide by any definition. There's been a grim calibration of this effect. 
1945, the, the US exploded uh, two bombs, one over Hiroshima and one over Nagasaki, Japan at the end of World War II. So there's some data, um, if you want to put it that way, uh, grim calibration. Uh, the attack on Hiroshima, one bomb, uh, killed over 100,000 people through burns from the flash and, uh, and from fires and from falling debris. It caused a, a four square mile firestorm, just fire extending over uh, two miles by two mile area. Uh, this was a, a relatively, in today's terms, a small nuclear weapon, just 15 kilotons, about 10 or 20 times smaller than the average bomb today. Uh, I guess probably seconds or minutes after the blast, this is what Hiroshima looked like. It used to be a city here that is completely leveled. Um, this is the, if you used a bomb with the, with the weapons usable fuel known as plutonium, this amount of plutonium would give you a bomb that would do this to Hiroshima. Uh, in World War II, there was so many cities where 100,000 people were killed by constant bombing, 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 but it took hundreds of, of uh, airplanes uh, dropping bombs. One bomb uh, destroyed this entire city of Hiroshima. So where are nuclear weapons today? Well, it's become a, uh, a big industry and nuclear weapons now are spread all over the world, well, all over the world in the sense of oh, they're spread over nine nations. And in the world's military stockpile, there are over 9,000 active nuclear warheads or nuclear bombs in our active military stockpile. So here we have the number of warheads and here we have them distributed over the, the nine nuclear weapons states. And you can see that over 90% of the nuclear warheads are held by Russia and the US. Don't worry about these colors, their, their details uh, won't get into that right now. And you can see the Russia and the US each have about uh, 4,000 active nuclear bombs. Um, but it looks like the other countries have small arsenals, but that's not the case. Uh, China, France, the UK have uh, two to 300, and that's an enormous nuclear arsenal. Pakistan and India, Israel, and most recently, uh, North Korea. So this is our problem today. Uh, these nuclear bombs are, need vehicles to deliver them. And there are three types of vehicles that are used to deliver nuclear bombs if they were ever to be delivered again. Submarines under the oceans, uh, these have an advantage in that they're survivable. You can't find submarines with technology today. So they're invulnerable and, and they can shoot off a, a missile that can go intercontinental very promptly. You have uh, aircraft or bombers that can carry multiple nuclear weapons, and these are, are flexible. And you can also, if you launch a, uh, a nuclear, an aircraft or nuclear weapons, and you change your mind, you can recall the aircraft. With a bomb, a uh, ballistic missile that's launched from a submarine, once it's launched, it's gone. If you made a mistake, nothing you can do about it. And then finally, there are uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, that are in underground silos. And these are prompt, they can be launched very quickly. So land, sea, and air, we can deliver nuclear missiles. In the world today, if you look at the total world arsenals, I don't know exactly, but there's something on the order of several thousand megatons of nuclear weapons. Um, this is the explosive equivalent of somewhere of several hundred thousand Hiroshima bombs. So you saw what one bomb did to Hiroshima. We have the explosive power in the world's arsenals of several hundred thousands of those. Um, this, is, uh, this is, to give you another calibration, all the bombing in World War II, which was uh, a catastrophe, uh, amounted to about three megatons of explosive power. So we have about a thousand times more explosive power than was uh, exploded in all of World War II. So the bombs we have can directly, if you just add up the numbers, kill billions of people, kill billions of people. But the threat doesn't stop there because there are indirect effects of nuclear weapons. And I wanna highlight one of them. Um, and this is the fact that uh, nuclear weapons have the capability to disrupt our global climate. And how does this happen? Nuclear weapons, if they're exploded where there's flammable materials, such as most cities, produces massive fires, such as a, has a, had occurred in Hiroshima. 
The fires are so massive that it produces huge amounts of carbon particles or soot. The soot is heated by the sun, sun and it rises into the Earth's stratosphere about between six and 30 miles above the Earth's surface. It spreads around the Earth, and this is an artist's rendition, our nice looking Earth uh, after nuclear explosions in flammable areas becomes shrouded in a, uh, in a shroud of carbon soot. And what's the effect of this? It blocks out some of the solar radiation, the radiation from the sun that we need for life and for crops. And as, to, as it would be expected, the Earth's temperature will decrease and the amount of sunlight reading, reaching the Earth will decrease. So sometimes referred to as a nuclear winter. And recently, in the last 10, 15 years, climate scientists have used modern uh, climate uh, modeling tools to uh, take a look in detail at what would happen with modern climate models. And they, one example, interesting example they have studied in recent years is a hypothetical war between India and Pakistan, two adversaries who are, have nuclear arsenals. And they assumed that between the two of them, they exploded a hundred Hiroshima-sized bombs, which are small bombs in today's wor uh, world. And this would be exploding about 0.1% of the world arsenal. And what they found is, uh, this is what happens to the globally average temperature in degrees Celsius. And here's a temperature of the, uh, of the globe from 1880 to the to current day. And you can see here's the global warming that we all know so much about. Nuclear war between India and Pakistan and the globally average temperature drops by uh, more than a degree centigrade, uh, greater over certain parts of the globe. And it takes about 10 years to recover back. And the climate scientists say this global climate change would be unprecedented in recorded human history and it would be instantaneous. And what would this do? It would cause the production of crop worldwide to drop uh, different crops, different places by 10 to 20%. And there have been some estimates that it could place uh, as many as maybe 2 billion people who are already on the edge at risk of famine. Uh, and you conclude from this that a war between India and Pakistan can place many, can kill many more people outside the war zone than within the war zone, where it would kill about 20 million people. And so one can conclude that nuclear weapons target innocent bystanders and innocent nations, where innocent means that nations that are not even party to the conflict. Well, these climate scientists have then gone on to consider the effects of a full-scale war between US and Russia. It's kind of a worst case. And here again is the global average temperature. Here's uh, with a different scale. And here's an India-Pakistan war. And here's an all-out war between US and Russia. And you can see that the temperature uh, globally average drops by about eight degrees Celsius, which would I think be about 17, 18 degrees Fahrenheit. And you get true nuclear winter. And they've looked in detail at what this does to crop production and caloric intake. And the result, just in a sentence, is that this would lead to global starvation. The average per capita caloric intake would be less than you need to maintain your, your, your energy, uh, even at rest. And so this leads one to conclude that a nuclear attack is also a suicide attack. These are all suicide bombs that are ready to go. So the effects are, are pretty drastic. And here's one. Uh, policy that we have in place or physical setting that we have in place is that in the United States and in Russia and in some other countries, there are weapons that are held on what I think are fairly characterized as hair trigger alert. That is uh, mostly in the US and Russia, there are about 1900 missiles that are on alert status in underground silos in the US, they're in the, uh, the Western states, uh, Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, and in subs prowling the oceans. These 1900 missiles are ready to launch within about 10 minutes of receiving an order. Now, and here's what it means to launch. Imagine here's Russia, they launched an a, a intercontinental ballistic missile. It goes hundreds of miles into outer space and 25 minutes later, it lands pretty accurately where they want to target it in the United States. This is civilization ending uh, amount of firepower ready to go at all times, as I said. 
Well, this is uh, <clears throat> fearsome because when you have something so ready to go, it's prone to accident, to technical accident, it's, it's vulnerable to a hasty decision. And I should point out in the US, the US president has the sole authority to launch a nuclear weapon. US president can decide to launch a weapon and nobody has a legal standard, legal standing to, uh, to object. And the president is under no obligation to consult anybody else. Uh, Richard Nixon famously said to an, an aide that I can just pick up the phone right now and in 25 minutes, uh, 70 million people would be dead. He was overstating, he was understating his power. A similar sole authority, we think, uh, resides in Russia and elsewhere. Um, so, you know, in a sense, with regard to nuclear weapons, uh, the United States is quite an autocracy. Uh, nobody else need play a role in this decision. Well, we've been uh, lucky that there has been no nuclear catastrophe, uh, no nuclear weapons exploded in conflict since, the, uh, since uh, Japan in 1945. But there have been many, many known close calls. And we've been lucky. <clears throat> and I just want to give <clears throat> two examples of many of false alarms that could have led to catastrophe. Just well, in 1980, uh, the National Security Advisor to uh, President Carter, I think it was, uh, uh, Brzezinski, was awakened in the middle of the night by news from the US military that 200 Soviet submarine launched nuclear missiles were headed to the US. And uh, bomber crews started their engines and missile crews opened the safes to get the launch code to launch nuclear weapons in retaliation. But a few minutes later, it was discovered that it wasn't real attack, it was just a defective computer chip. Uh, going the other way, in 1985, Russian radar detected a, that the United States had launched from submarine uh, missiles to strike in about 15 minutes. Uh, the Russian nuclear forces went on full alert and President Yeltsin retrieved the nuclear launch codes that would allow him to activate a, a retaliatory launch in the United States. False alarm, the cause was just a US scientific rocket that was launched to study the Aurora. Uh, in uh, each of these cases, and in other cases I can cite, I mean, there's just um, many, many cases of false alarms and other near accidents, near, near catastrophic accidents. Some human being intuited the, in this case, the alarm to be false and didn't communicate the result completely up the chain, sometimes disobeying orders. So for example, uh, Russia had a, a protocol where if this is detected, income US missiles, uh, the president should be immediately informed. And if he was immediately informed, he might have immediately decided to retaliate. Uh, but the Soviet military officer intuited this wasn't real and made the independent decision not to inform the president. Um, this, uh, these close calls have led General Lee Butler, who had been the head of the US Strategic Command that has control of nuclear weapons, to state uh, that we escaped the Cold War without a nuclear holocaust by some combination of skill, luck, and divine intervention. And I suspect the latter in greatest proportion. So where are we today? And, and unfortunately, the, new, the nuclear world order is now in crisis. Uh, things are not good today. And this has been shown, uh, not shown, but this is sort of uh, illustrated metaphorically by the doomsday clock. Uh, that the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists issues every year after deliberation by a committee of experts. Uh, they issue a, a clock which tells us how many, how much time we are before midnight, where midnight is, is, is a catastrophic event for the, for the globe. And in 2020 and 2021, uh, because of the perilous geopolitical and technological changes, they set the doomsday clock at 100 seconds to midnight which is the closest it's ever been since 1945 and since throughout the whole Cold War. And part of the reason, as I'll get into, is because we are now slipping into a new nuclear arms race in the world. And let me indicate the increasing nuclear dangers because they're manifold. Uh, first, there has been a gradual proliferation of nuclear weapon states. It's not just the US and the Soviet Union, US and Russia, it's multipolar and complex. There are nine nations that have nuclear weapons. 
Uh, lots of adversary nations within those nine were more accident prone. This is less controllable. There are many more scenarios now for possible nuclear uh, escalation of a war. Uh, it's a complex situation. There are non-state actors, terrorists, which has been a lot, a lot discussed. I won't discuss it now. A very concerning technological change is the threat of cyber attacks and what that can do to uh, the nuclear weapons complex. Uh, you can only imagine what cyber attacks can do. A cyber attack can produce a false warning of an attack and lead a country to retaliate where they need not, or you can imagine it hiding a real attack. A cyber attack can, uh, can uh, uh, weaken the effect of communication between a leader and leader's military during a crisis. Uh, perhaps the worst case, you can imagine a cyber attack enabling an unauthorized use of a nuclear warhead, actually triggering the use of a nuclear warhead. With the threat of cyber attacks, um, it's probably fair to say that we can't guarantee that we have uh, complete control of our, over our own nuclear weapons. And this is a new uh, threat. Another problem which is in the policy sphere is that the regime of arms control agreements that have kept things in check through luck, but also through agreements between the US and the Soviet Union is eroding and falling away. And I'll just show four examples uh, of that. Um, because of various withdrawals of treaties by the US and Russia, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the Iran Nuclear Deal, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the Open Skies Treaty have all collapsed. Between the US and Russia, there's one treaty that is keeping things in check and it's called the New START Treaty that limits the number of warheads on each side and that's set to expire in 2026. So things have been eroding. And uh, to cap it off, we are now in a new nuclear arms race. All the nuclear weapon states, uh, particularly the three superpowers, US, China, and Russia, are modernizing their nuclear weapons, uh, replacing their arsenals with more modern ones. Uh, and uh, this vast modernization uh, and capability improvement is really uh, giving the technological hip capability to com commit the world to nuclear weapons really toward to the end of the century. In the United States, we're beginning a program which will cost about one and a half trillion dollars over the next 30 years, one and a half trillion dollars to replace all aspects of our nuclear weapons, the weapons themselves, their control systems, and so on. All the submarines, everything. And imagine what better use can be put to that with that money. We're building new weapons and new defenses in these three superpowers. So we're in the midst of a new nuclear arms race. Um, these facts have led a former Secretary of Defense, William Perry, who's at Stanford University, to say that today, the danger of some sort of nuclear catastrophe is greater than it was during the Cold War, and most people are blissfully unaware of this danger. He said this in 2015, uh, that the threat now is greater than it's ever been. Uh, unfortunately, in the previous uh, six or seven years, uh, things have only gotten worse, nothing has gotten better. Um, to, to cap it off, we all know about two weeks ago, uh, Putin stated that he put Russia's nuclear forces on combat duty alert. It's not clear what that means. Uh, he, he already has alert uh, weapons on alert status, uh, but nonetheless, this is clearly expressing uh, something of his thought process. And then he states, it's so, a quote, whoever tries to interfere with us should know that Russia's response will be immediate and will lead you to such consequences as you have never experienced in your history. Russia is today one of the most powerful nuclear states. This is a threat coming from a man who has the capability to pretty much kill about everybody on earth. Um, so this has to be taken uh, seriously. Uh, his statement, not completely, but it breaks a nuclear taboo. All re responsible uh, leaders of nuclear nations, for the most part, recognize that you should never threaten to use a nuclear weapon. They are only, uh, in principle, used as a deterrent, as a threat of retaliation to keep someone else from bombing you with a nuclear weapon. 
And Putin just uh, really broke that taboo, which has the effect of normalizing nuclear weapons as weapons of war, which they should never be. Now, he's not totally unique. They were weaker. This was done also. Uh, Trump uh, made threats. Kim Jong-un from North Korea made threats. They were weaker in the sense that Putin is making this threat in the middle of a, a hot crisis. It's led to the discussion in the, in the press of uh, what's the likelihood of him actually doing it. And most people say it's unlikely, but it's shocking to me in that this would even be a point of discussion. And as I said before, uh, people talk about, will he use it, won't he use it, what will it mean? And we should bear in mind that nobody understands nuclear weapons. Uh, as I said before, I'll repeat it, prior wars have taught us nothing. They all had weapons millions of times weaker. Nobody understands the consequences of these weapons. No one understands the complete climate effects, uh, the effects on societal, infra societal infrastructure. The only thing we know from past wars that's directly relevant to introducing nuclear weapons into war is that there's fog of war. And once we introduce a nuclear weapon into war, no one knows what will happen. Not the most experienced uh, military general. Um, what have we learned from the Ukraine, Ukraine crisis? Or what can we observe? Well, one thing we observe is that nuclear weapons, well, uh, not, not, not other than deterring, they actually can provide a cover for aggression. You know, what, Putin having, having nuclear weapons uh, clearly makes him more comfortable waging aggression because he has nuclear weapons to keep the US and others from, from getting involved. Nuclear weapons, the possession of nuclear weapons by some encouraged proliferation by others. The Ukraine had nuclear weapons, a big arsenal when the, when the Soviet Union fell apart and it voluntarily gave them up in 1994. Clearly, other nations can observe this and say, did Ukraine make a mistake in giving up nuclear weapons? <clears throat> Another <clears throat> point, and the reason I had Putin's picture in the previous slide, is that this is a problem that is not a problem of, of world leaders, it's a problem that's intrinsic to nuclear weapons. As long as nuclear weapons are safe or exist, we're not safe from them, no matter who owns them. Because you can have a, a country that where the, uh, the leader of the country can go from bad to good, sane to crazy, or crazy to sane. We've seen that happen in many countries. The leaders can just flip. And the existence of the nuclear weapons uh, are inherently dangerous, and it doesn't matter who owns them. I should, uh, of course, we should all brace ourselves because uh, Putin's comments, it might lead some to say we need to get rid of these nuclear weapons, but it's for sure going to lead to calls for the U.S. to develop more nuclear weapons capability. I guarantee you, you're going to hear calls that we have to strengthen our nuclear weapons capability, and I think that would be a mistake. Now, um, clearly, to get out of this uh, dilemma, we need to put pressure on governments to to try to fix this problem. And indeed, governments can act to reduce the threat. And I wanna give some examples from the past of good things that have happened. In 1970, there was a nuclear non-proliferation treaty. It was signed by all nations except three. And it was a deal. Nuclear we Non-nuclear weapon states agreed never to develop nuclear weapons. And at that time, there were five nuclear weapon states and they agreed to work toward uh, nuclear disarmament. So it was a deal. The deal has been uh, very successful uh, from a proliferation point of view. From 1945 to today, you can see that the number of, of weapons states have proliferated from the then five to the today nine. And it's kind of held. This isn't great, uh, but in the 50s, there were predictions that by today we would have several dozen nuclear weapon states. And we don't, thanks to the non-proliferation treaty. It set a legal requirement on nuclear weapon states to, to disarm, and that has not yet been fulfilled. Uh, through treaties and agreements between the US and the Soviet Union and then Russia, there's been a drastic reduction in the number of warheads in the world. This is the number of warheads versus year. And, and just look at the gray, which is the total warheads in, in the globe. And there was this crazy buildup to 70,000 warheads in the mid 80s. And then through agreements, Reagan, Gorbachev, George Bush, all throughout different Republican and Democratic administrations here in the U.S., it was just brought down by about 85 percent. The weapons were dismantled and destroyed, and uh, the world was made safer. We're still in a very bad state, but 
there was a drastic reduction in the number of warheads, human beings can get together and disarm. There are nuclear weapon-free zones in the globe. By treaty, there are six treaties that establish regions that are nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons free. Nuclear weapons can't be cannot be manufactured, stored, uh, owned in these, in these regions that you can read here. And what does that mean for the globe? It means the following. Uh, these blue countries are countries that are nu nuclear weapon free zones that have no nuclear weapons on their property. It's the entire Southern hemisphere. The red states are nuclear weapon states and the, the yellow ones are, are neither nuclear weapon free zones nor nuclear weapon states. And- uh, Sorry to interrupt Dr. Bricker. I just wanted to give you a two minute warning. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. Um, and you can see that the, the Southern hemisphere has in fact no nuclear weapons and no reason we can't extend that to the rest of the globe. And finally, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in recent years, there was a new treaty called the Tre Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons uh, that bans nuclear weapons for the globe. And it was adopted at the UN by a vote of 122 to one. 69 states uh, did not vote, they kind of boycotted the vote. It entered into, a for, into force a year ago when it was ratified by 50 nations. Uh, the, the group that campaigned for this uh, got the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. It hasn't dismantled a single warhead, but it sets a new norm, a new ethical norm, if you like, for the globe. There are many, many things that can be done to dis decrease the threat. I'm just going to read through this. Uh, in fact, many things that the U.S. can do, even unilaterally. It can take warheads off of hair trigger alert. There's no reason they need to be in alert status. We can implement a no first use policy, which says we will never be the first to use it in conflict. We won't start a nuclear war. We don't have such a, a policy. We reserve the right to start a nuclear war. We can abandon the option that we, we presently preserve to launch on just a, a warning that uh, another country has launched an attack, even if the warning is false. We should restart arms reduction talks with Russia, which are stalled, and many, many, many more things. It's often said that nuclear weapons cannot be uninvented. This is true. Uh, they can't be uninvented. We have the knowledge. But it's often said that the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, but in fact, the genie can be substantially put back in the bottle, and we can be made drastically, drastically safer, even with the knowledge that humanity has uh, with regard to nuclear weapons. And I, <clears throat> I might say in closing that we have established this, uh, to get a bit parochial, the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction. I won't discuss it here, but I just want to say that we're building a national network of physical scientists to advocate for nuclear threat reduction. And it's open to all physical scientists, not just physicists, astronomers, earth scientists, geophysicists, engineers. And uh, uh, I would invite anybody who falls in this very broad category of physical science to join our physicist coalition. It's not for experts, it's for ordinary physical scientists who are just interested to uh, have an opportunity to advocate uh, for steps to reduce the threat. And here is the website, physicistcoalitions.org. For those of you that aren't physical scientists, I would encourage you, and this is me speaking, not the American Physical Society, uh, there are many organizations where you can get information and, and be active. There's the Union of Concerned Scientists, Arms Control Association, Plowshares Fund, the Federation of American Scientists. These are all organizations where you can get information and vehicles to maybe participate. Uh, so one thing this uh, crisis, nuke, Ukraine crisis has done, it's led to this cartoon, which says, uh, you can just read it, maybe it'll help wake people up to what has been an invisible threat. And with that, I'll close and look forward to a discussion. Great. Thank you very much for uh, all those remarks, Dr. Pegger. I appreciate it. So yeah, I want to quickly get to some comments and questions. Um, the first one was a comment, and it was the point that um, pointing out the uh, effects of nuclear testing. Um, so in particular, that much testing was done on reservations and also colonized territories like the Marshall Islands. Um, and that the testing continues to impact those um, to the present day with many implications for health disparities. And so that's just a comment. I guess I'll add that, you know, the coalition, the physicist coalition that we're both a part of 
has come out against any um, explosive nuclear testing um, at all for the United States. Um, but I don't know, was there any other, uh, did you want to respond to, um, with anything Oh, no, I, mean, I, I, I don't, the, the, state, the, the comment is, is of course correct and important. Uh, there was a, a year ago, there was a discussion in Congress of, of some, some legislators wanted to resume nuclear testing in the United States, which hasn't occurred since uh, 1996 or so. And our coalition lobbied against it and, and, it, and it never occurred. Great. Um, yeah, let, let me um, kind of group a few other questions um, that variously have to do with about like actual attacks on the United States, um, about how do we protect ourselves? What would the steps be? Um, somebody specifically asked about, um, do you think like civil defense programs will ever come back in vogue? Um, now that the, there's maybe a new kind of Cold War heating up, do, do you think this would be worthwhile or would just further sort of normalize the existence of nuclear weapons? I don't know the answer. In the 50s, uh, the civil defense, as we all know, were ridiculous. Uh, we remember, I, I remember uh, hiding under my desk in elementary school uh, at certain times, having drills to hide under your desks. Uh, I think that there's no useful, def there's no useful civil defense. Uh, may may maybe, maybe some experts would disagree with me, but I think there's almost nothing you can do. There was, uh, in the 1980s, there was a great TV uh, movie, uh, The Day After. I'd encourage you to watch it. People went into the fallout shelters. Uh, don't think it did much good. So I, I'm not aware of any effective uh, uh, nationwide civil defense, unfortunately. Okay, appreciate the answer. And that actually answered a, another specific question about the day after. Um, no. So I appreciate you addressing that. Okay, um, another audience member asks about the following. Recent severe economic sanctions imposed on Russia seem to be aimed at collapsing the Russian state and making it a failed state. Should the Russian state collapse, what possible ramifications will that have on Russia's nuclear arsenal? That's a very serious question. It, it's definitely goes, it's a political science question in part goes beyond my expertise. So I, I can't say anything authoritative or <laughs> intelligent, but I think one, one thing <clears throat> in regards to keeping nuclear weapons in check, uh, in the past, say between the US and Soviet Union, nuclear weapons, uh, negotiations were modularized. They were separated out from all other considerations. So, so no matter what's happening in the world, no matter how bad or good any other nation is, it's critical that we always negotiate nuclear weapons. You know, if, if Hitler was alive today, uh, you'd want to negotiate nuclear and had nuclear weapons, you want to negotiate nuclear weapons with him. Uh, and if the Russian uh, uh, economy uh, collapses in some way, and if the Russian society be, falls into some chaos in some way, uh, it's going to be uh, absolutely critical to have sane and rational uh, nuclear negotiations. Now, of course, the, the big fear is that that resides upon the, the sanity and the wisdom of them having a rational leader. And this is what's has brought home, what the Ukraine crisis has brought home. It's just astonishing that in the world we live today, you turn on the TV and all the experts on Russia are debating the psychology of one person, Putin, psychology. And that's what we're reduced to. Uh, the, the world's nuclear safety depends on the psychology of one or a couple of people. And so that's the, you know, that's implicit in the question that's asked. That's a scary part of if a country falls into chaos or if it falls into a, a, a state that's so autocratic that their ruler becomes detached from realistic advice. Uh, it's bad. I, I know I'm not giving a coherent answer because there's none to give. Oh, I appreciate your response though. Um, okay. Um, let me go to a, a somewhat technical question, maybe coming back to your first point. Like, um, yeah, there's a question about is there a way that most nuclear weapons can be permanently deactivated um, or, or destroyed and, and safely disposed of? So maybe you could just uh, uh, yes. emphasize. Yes, yes. It's, it's, not, it's, not a it's, just, it's not a technical challenge to dismantle, take apart uh, nuclear weapons. They're, they're, just, they're not mystical things, they're just objects. Uh, you can take them apart. Uh, you can take the chemical explosion, the electronics, you can take it apart. And then you have the fissile fuel and fusion fuel itself. 
and uh, plutonium, you know, can be can be buried. And uranium, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, they uh, they in the U.S. Uh, well, when the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union collapsed, and the U.S. and the and the and the Soviet Union were decreasing their stockpiles, you can take uranium. When we took Soviet highly enriched uranium, and we and we blended it down so that it wasn't highly enriched. And then we put it in nuclear reactors and it made peaceful energy in the world. So the answer is yes, you can dismantle it. There's a four minute video if you want to go into YouTube and you put how to dismantle a nuclear weapon, four minute video, and it'll kind of give you a little cute uh, four minutes on how to do that. Okay, great. Um, we might be able to get in one or two more. Um, let's try this one. What was the logic of US and Russia maintaining stockpiles at 6,000 plus? weapons. Was this to make sure that the US and Russia continued to be um, heavyweights in light of the growth in weapons? Uh, will the US and Russia ever go lower if India, Pakistan, France, Israel, etc. don't go lower first? The, the logic is the logic of nuclear arms racing and it's an irrational logic. Um, it's in play today. Uh, one country and, and one country develops some weapon, another country wants to develop a, 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 that weapon plus one. And then the other country wants to develop that weapon plus one. And it just builds its way up. And it's fed by a, a dynamic where nation A always does a worst case analysis of the potent, of the power of nation B. Uh, and, that, and so each nation assumes the uh, worst on uh, regards to the other nation. And it just fuels the arms race going up. It's, a, it's irrational, it's illogical. And it's one of these examples where a nation may think it's doing something for its individual good, but when all nations do it, it, it causes, uh, it does exactly the opposite to the commons. Uh, do I think the US and Russia, I think the question was, will ever get below the, the, the number we have today? Um, yes, it's totally, it's totally, there's absolutely no reason it shouldn't. We were on that trajectory and it's just stalled out in recent years. And uh, there's no reason that it cannot continue. So I think it could very well happen. It just takes, a. Uh, uh, two rational leaders in the two countries, and maybe in the U.S., backed up by a, a rational Congress. Okay, great. Um, maybe I'll the the last question um, is the following, and the audience member assures us he's not being facetious. Please help us understand how you and or we sleep at night, knowing all of this. I think we sleep at night. <clears throat> Uh, uh, well, since I've, I've started working on it, I, it, it has, I am living a more perturbed life, but we sleep just like the person who's uh, unaware, unaware, right? It, it's, it goes back to what I was first saying. This threat is so difficult to grasp. Uh, so it's, it's too hard to grasp. So I find my brain puts it aside, right? You, you can't go to sleep and think. If you go to sleep and think, Putin, ha Putin in 10 minutes, he can send a missile over and wipe us all out. It's too incomprehensible. So I find the human brain, even of those that uh, think about this all the time, can't accept that as reality and one puts it aside. Um, Secretary of Defense Perry, I think it was, he got a call in the middle of the night, uh, false alarm, you know, weapons headed and, uh, uh, to the US and Russia. And he said, I didn't wake my wife because I figured she'll just gonna die soon. Uh, I don't know what that says, but I think even people who work in nuclear weapons can't believe that it's actually going to happen. We didn't, we didn't think a pandemic would happen until it happened, right? Things don't happen until they happen. But even people who uh, think about this all the time, I think, can't quite grasp that it will, it will happen. And the brain rejects it. And that's how you sleep. OK, well, thank you very much for, um, for everything you shared with us today, Dr. Prager. And um, yeah, I think we will. Um, conclude the event at this time. And um, Dr. Armelie, did you want to come back to close us out? Sure. Uh, I wanted to, to just say thank you again publicly uh, to Dr. Asplund and also to Dr. Prager um, from Princeton's University's uh, astrophysics, uh, I'm sorry, astrophysics department. Um, and I hope the audience joins me in, in, in thanking uh, our guests for today. Uh, I know I learned a great deal and this is a subject that I actually researched. So this has been very helpful for my own research. Um, and it sounds like from our audience, uh, they learned a great deal as well. And so please join me in the chat by thanking um, our, our guests for today. 
And I would like to thank you on behalf of the Human Rights Institute and everyone at San Jose State for joining us for the Human Rights Lecture Series this week. Uh, and again, please look out for us every spring. We'll be putting on this lecture series every year. Uh, coming up in April, for those of you who are San Jose State folks, uh, we have our Spring Research Colloquium coming up on April 28th. You can find more of that on our website and more of our work in general on our website. I'm putting it in the chat now. Uh, and you can also follow us on Twitter at SJSU Human Rights. And again, I thank you all for coming and I hope you have a wonderful weekend.